Okay, welcome back to this uh, fourth and last part of this um, Elway uh, marathon. <laughs> um, now we're going to talk about some of the things that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, some of the um, uh, some of the like more special cases, um, like foreign body airway obstruction. And we'll talk a bit about CPR and the airway management and that. And we'll talk a bit about uh, and we'll talk a, li a bit longer about. Um, tracheostomies as well, because these are the patients that we actually do see. Okay, so some of the other stuff here. Let's talk about foreign body airway jet ventilation and uh, children. I've uh, again, I've put a lot of this stuff on on acutemedicine.dk, so you can check it out there as well. This is the current algorithm from the ERC guidelines. So if you have someone, usually children, but also for adults, someone who is suspected of having a foreign body area obstruction, then you will, of course, encourage them to cough if they have an, an uh, effective cough. So this is this, this step, effective cough. They're, they're standing, they're coughing, then they'll, then they'll go here. A special case here is the children that sometimes do have a suspected foreign body error obstruction where they keep coughing and they, they never go uh, into the other part of this um, algorithm. But um, these children you can often keep in the emergency department uh, for observation so that they don't go in here, uh, encourage them to cough, and sometimes maybe you have to remove it, but um, with, with a... Um, with a um, uh, fiber, fibroscope or something similar, but uh, usually it can be managed over here. Once the patient develops an ineffective cough, this is when you are going to do the classical Heimlich maneuver, um, five, um, uh, five uh, th um, thumps in the, in the in the thorax, um, uh, where you you sure. Um, when you take one of your hands and make a fist, and then you use the other hand to um, the palm of the other hand uh, will enclose that fist, and you will push inwards and upwards to use the lungs uh, to, to use the lungs as a um, uh, as as like a, a blow, um, what's it called, like a wind blower, um, um, and. You'll do this five times, and you'll uh, you, you will you will uh, feel the patient's uh, rip, uh, the sternum, the distal sternum, and when it goes into the um, um, the, the soft part going into the stomach, that's where you will push, right uh, right uh, below the sternum, and then inwards and upwards. And then if that doesn't work, you'll turn the patient around. Usually they can be sitting, and you'll try to um, get them uh, to to. Um, face forward a bit and downwards a bit if they can and then you'll push on the lower part of the um, thoracic cage uh, like with blows what you call back blows and then uh, see if they, you can um, get them to um, push up the um, foreign body um, in children it's a little bit different um, um, I think the new guidelines are saying below one year. That's when you're going to do it a little bit different. You'll usually um, have to twist the baby um, with a with a fork grip around their hand uh, around their head. Um, first, um, first with, with them lying on your on your um, on your um, uh, on your arm, and and then pushing with the two fingers on their uh, on the same area. Uh, on the stomach as you would an adult, just with two fingers this time. And then you'll do the scissor grip um, with both hands trying to turn around the baby and then push, um, do five back blows. And you'll continue doing this until um, you either get the thing loose that was obstructing the airway or they become unconscious. If they become unconscious, uh, then you will go into uh, CPR mode, even though they might still have a pulse. Um, usually, you, you will not check in that situation, but you'll, you'll nevertheless go into CPR mode. And here, there is an important thing for especially Swedish emergency physicians. 
because during according to the Swedish guidelines, when they become unconscious, um, then besides doing the um, CPR, um, which in this case might help, like um, like Heimlich maneuver to get the, the thing up. Uh, you will also prioritize to look into the mouth. If there, if you can see the foreign body in the mouth, you can, you may attempt a finger sweep according to the Swedish uh, uh, Utbildningsmaterial, uh, like education material. But if you can't see anything, then you will try, then you will try um, to use a McGill's um, a McGill's um, um, device to try to get uh, get it up if you can see uh, if, if if you can see it with a laryngoscope. Um, and otherwise, you will um, prioritize to um, try to intubate uh, the 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 the, the, um, the patient if you cannot uh, visualize the element. Um, um, and the purpose of this intubation is to push uh, the tube down so that you're pushing the potential foreign body um, further down and hopefully into the lung. And then you'll do an intubation and you'll pull back the, um, the tube once it's, uh, once it's in the lung. Uh, and you, uh, you kind of, you, Mind might have a hint that it's in the lung when the if the patient has diminished breath sound on one side, and if you feel a if if you have to push the tube down and then it suddenly gives away, then it seems like you have you have um, pushed it into the lungs. Um, this is probably the best way to do it, even in children. Um, the thing is with the with the um, the front of neck axis is that if you have a foreign body that is below the vocal cords, then, uh, oh, sorry, below the cracothyroid membrane, then, then it probably won't help you to, to do a, um, cracothyroidectomy or a needle cracothyroidectomy, which I'll show you, um, soon. So this method of trying to intubate or, um, is probably the one that will help you the most. And I know, uh, I, I, I believe that the um, Difficult Airways Society uh, are against the rulings, uh, the, 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 the jet ventilation that I'll show you um, soon enough. Just to know that this area is really controversial, it's, it's something that is a horrible um, situation, and you, you tr but it's nice to have some tools in your toolbox to, to use, and I think, if I ever stand in this situation, I'll try to grab the laryngoscope and I'll try to get um, to get the thing up with a McGill's. And if I can't see anything, I'll try to intubate. Okay. Um, we will now go into a, a bit more details about what the um, Swedish Society of Emergency Medicine wants you to know about. Um, that is the needle cricothyroidectomy. Oh, sorry, just before we move on, there is one single thing that there is one thing I know some colleagues that has been in this situation also tried. Depending on, um, sometimes you have a foreign body that is really soft, or that you cannot grab with a McGill's uh, uh, tongue, uh, even though even though you um, can see it. Um, it might be a ball that is stuck in the upper part of the like uh, laryngopharynx, but you can't really push it down because it's too big, and you can't really get a grab on it because it's too mushy or it's too um, uh, round and slippery. And in that case, uh, I know sometimes you could you could try to. Um, dislocate the, the, the child's jaw so that you can reach in and and take out the thing or you could try to destroy the thing with if you have any instruments to do that uh, or impale the thing and then pull it out i mean any desperate method method uh, helps in these situations i think it's important just to also know that that could be a scenario and you there is some uh, some things that might might also be done in those situations but now to the needle uh, crack um, 
and the needle crack might be something that could have been used in such a situation but the the, the child's um airway is the size is the size of their little finger it's like regular that's a rule of thumb or little finger if you want um and it's notoriously hard to get into even um, even as an, uh, even for adults it might be a bit hard um to get into the airway so this is something that is a desperate method measure what you do is that you'll um, get a um, 14 um, or 16 gauge needle which is not gray it will be orange um, and you will get a, um, a three milliliter um, syringe with a bit of um, salt water in it um, the salt water is uh, because you want some kind of feedback when you know that you're in the airway. It's a good thing every time you're sticking something into the a body cavity, which has air. It's a good thing to have such a uh, such a um, device just uh, just to see that you're actually in the airway uh, when it bubbles. So you will um, you will do the laryngeal handshake bear in mind like you'll do all the things that i talk, talked to you about during the fauna uh part of the lecture and you will then stick in this needle um and hopefully you will hit the cracothyroid membrane and when that is done then uh, you will see bubbles if you pull back on 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 the syringe and this is where the algorithm um it goes into two parts um, depending on the age of the child because once you're in the way you will ventilate the patient sorry oxygenate the patient uh, is, is is different depending on the age um, you the reason why you are not, you're not ventilating this patient because they will not be able to uh, get out any um, co2 this way so it's primarily an oxygen or it's entirely an oxygenation and, and, and a desperate measure until you can get somewhere where you can get a definite airway. Um, some quotes say that so some sources say that it's like you can buy maybe 15, 20 minutes like this. Okay, so for the patients that are below five years of age, um, this is what you'll need. Fui's figures from first 10 em has made this a great um, um, mnemonic um, or uh, flashcard or what you want to call it um, uh, algorithm in a pic in a picture and i've made this um, from the equipment is seen on homepage where where you uh, where i've shown you what you need you will need a back bell mask um, but be, for this piece of the back bell mask to be able to fit on your um, on your um, on your uh, uh, on your IV, you'll need to attach it to the three milliliter syringe. Uh, but the three milliliter syringe doesn't fit directly on that, and that's why you need some kind of adaptation device, which I uh, mentioned earlier comes from the um, from the um, from the tube, the intubation tube. And depending on the size of the syringe, and depending on the uh, on the on the um, uh, sorry, depending on the, the size of the syringe, you'll need a different uh, size tube with, with a different size connector. But for a three milliliter syringe, um, you will be able to uh, fit um, a you, you'll use a seven point five um, tube. And once it's connected, you will back well mask the patient as you otherwise would. For the above five year old, uh, olds, and of course below 10 to 12 years, depending on the, uh, the child, because when they give above this age, you will try a conventional um, cragothyroidectomy um on these patients but ab above five years of age you'll try this jet ventilation and this is again controversial i think the uh, the, um, the um, society of um, difficult airway the difficult airway society um, are against this um because there are high risk of you blowing 
high uh, there, there's the risk of bar, bar trauma there's risk of you not hitting the right air, like the getting into the airway and then you blow, blowing um, air into uh, subcutaneous tissue but this is a desperate situation as the, at least you'll know that this is a tool in your toolbox and then you can consider uh, in this situation what you will do again i think if you i will really try to do intubation because that is usually what has the highest success success rate but this is a tool that you can use so what you'll need here is that you will you have your um, needle in the airway um, what you'll do is you'll have a um, um, one of these um, three stop cock i think it's called in english Trevex uh, Kran in Swedish. Um, and what you'll do now is that you'll connect this to um, um, uh, to your usual uh, oxygen supply, um, just 15 liters of air uh, or of, of oxygen, and um, then you'll um, make this um, stopcock so that um, it's open uh, here. And th because this means that you can uh, use this as a ventilation or uh, oxygenation device or a ventilation device so that every time you um, hold this then you will blow and every time you don't hold it then the air will go out the easiest way here so so it go it goes one two three and then one blow and then one two three four blow and one two three four blow sorry i thought i thought i thought i only counted to three the first time it's four to one so it's one two three four and then one second blow and then one two three four and then one second blow yeah that's how you will uh, ventilate if you don't have a um one of these um uh, three ways uh, three ways stop cock i think <laughs> it was called something like that um, you can always use um, the. Uh, you can always use uh, this kind of device, which is a um, just a nasal prong, and you'll stop the, the, one of the ends of the like the nostrils into the, your PVK, and then you'll ventilate. Do the same thing with ventilation with this instead. So that's what you can do. Okay. Some other stuff. Now we talked about jet ventilation and children's uh, foreign body airway obstruction. We'll talk about trach emergencies later. Um, we have, I've just mentioned uh, quickly the salad method, and, uh, and this is where you have a dirty airway, someone who's actually aspirating while you're trying to intubate, and this is where you use your yank hour. Maybe you have two yank hours, and you just push that into the esophagus. Um, and, or, or clean the airway, then push that into the esophagus. Once you've gotten all the way down to that, it makes ta might take a little while. And you'll try to um, make the Yankar stay in the esophagus while you're um, trying to intubate. Um, there are different nuances here, and I'll just encourage you to check out the FOMED videos on this. Um, Okay, then we have already talked a bit about how to be a good assistant, that it's, it takes practice and fellowship, and you need to anticipate what the what the, the, patient, the person at the um, airway needs before they actually think they need it. Um, PSA, we have talked about uh, that you should check out Ruben Spears' video uh, on PSA, tri uh, tri uh, PSA Trilogy video. Um, I guess we can talk about uh, the difference between sedation and induction, like uh, when the patient is going to sleep. And the main difference is that the patient during sedation will keep a patent uh, airway. They will, you know, they will be able to breathe by themselves, in theory. Um, but as you, as you might have seen before during sedations, sometimes the patient loses their airway. During sedation, uh, so there's a gray area, um, and it's really important that we monitor the patient and we prepare. Um, when we give our sedation drugs, you prepare, you you have prepared the sedation as if it was an in, uh, intubation. You may not have uh, unpacked all the stuff, 
because it's rarely needed and and it will be very expensive if we have to to unpack all the stuff for intubation every time we do a sedation but you will at least have it at bedside so that you can quickly do uh, do what you need to do if they lose their airway and and and, and do some measures there the thing is with sedation is that usually you, it's just temporarily you they will get over um, the um, the uh, lost airway uh, pretty quickly if especially if you're using a drug like propofol and then uh, it'll be all right but you have to do some temporizing measures while they're not all right and and you need to notice that they're not all right and then the monitoring the noticing of this um, is is among other uh, one of the take-home messages there is it's important to have an entitled co2 on the patient while you're doing it it's also important to know your half-life uh, and your like the dosing uh, of your sedation drugs because if you know the half-life then you know kind of how long you need to to do um, these temporizing measures to to get the patient in the clear um, sedation there's also a risk assessment in sedation because if you have usually, usually patients for where you have to sedate them are not fasting um, and if you can then you'll probably have them fasted but if you can't then um it's, 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 for instance if you have if you have um if you have a patient with a bad um, angle fracture and you have to um, uh, reposition it uh, quickly then you'll probably use then you'll, you'll, then you'll be aware that there is an aspiration risk and you'll take this into calculation also be in my be mindful of the lower dosing in general with sedation uh, compared to induction um, I think that's probably what I want to say about the sedation right now. I might make a video about this uh, later on, but um, for now we'll stay with that. And then you can check out the EM updates videos um, from Ruben Strayer. CPR situations is one of my favorite topics to talk about and act uh, as a team leader in. Um, I've written a bit about it in, on the blog as well. Um, but I might make a larger video on this early uh, in, in at a later stage. Um, the main things about CPR is that it's pretty simple in my head to do it, uh, like on th in theory. But the way it co becomes complex is all the human factor stuff, and that's why it's so exciting for me to to uh, talk about it because there's so much to talk about. Um, the simple stuff is that well, first of all, you need good compression decompressions high quality and um, uh, whether you're using a mechanical device or you're using people for this you need to know that people cannot withstand uh, the compressions uh, quality the compression quality for at least more than two minutes and probably less if they're not experienced at it or strong um, and they often fail to decompress the chest um, and and also fail to push hard enough sometimes so you need to maintain that it's important to see that there is good compressions. With good compressions, you will always see a pulse. Um, um, you will measure the uh, either by focus or by your hand. The thing about using your hand for this is that we is hugely um, unreliable and notoriously unreliable. And in studies, it's like flipping a, a coin. You might increase your security in using your hand for pulse checks by um, Getting, uh, getting your hand on the pulse uh, of the neck um, uh, during CPR. There should be a pulse, as I said, uh, during CPR. Otherwise, you have to change something. <laughs> um, and when there's no, uh, and then in the an uh, analyzing phase uh, after the two minutes of CPR, then um, then. If, if you keep your hand there um, at the same spot, then you can feel, oh, is there a change now? Instead of just going blindly when there is a pulse check stop, then, then, then you probably won't find it at that time. And you will um, increase the uh, pause. And that is the pr biggest, biggest problem right now. That is um, and what we're going to talk about with the airways is that you should 
diminish the like minimize the pauses for compressions because you have to you know, there's a ramp up period after you do the compression or after you do the stop of the compressions then it takes a few uh, not a few a, a couple of seconds before you have ramped up the um, compressions and uh, and the, the circulation is going again this is really really important uh, the compressions. So that's the compressions. Uh, so you do compressions, then you do defibrillation if you, or um, like as long, uh, the, as fast as you can. The first rhythm check is um, is going to be with pads on, and then just check the rhythm. And then the third um, part of the CPR is like your reversible courses. Um, and then maybe I, I always sometimes add a fourth and a fifth, which is the fourth is end of life decision making that is like your fourth priority and then your fifth um, priority might be ECMO um, uh, if you have a young patient uh, and you're in your ECMO center that this this is your uh, this is something you have to think about really really early on um, but in most centers this is not an opportunity so that's why I, I place it at fifth all right um, so once you have the three and and to, to make make all of this happen there's a lot of human factors that goes into this which i will not go into right now but when it comes to airway management in these situations there has been some studies um i think it was from france the last couple of years where where the, there was a question whether intubation was a high priority and these studies showed that uh, intubation was not a high priority it was not they did they didn't have a mortality or morbidity benefit compared to back valve masking or um doing a super superglottic airway though there are certain scenarios where the airway has has a priority we just we just went through the foreign body airway um that's one of the one of the scenarios where it has a priority it has a priority in in hypoxic patients because you don't know whether they were hypoxic or not uh, if they were found down and you need to like your four h's and your four t's you need to secure those before you can terminate the um, um, the um, resuscitation um, appropriately at least if, if 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 especially if there's uh, if, if it's a younger person person with a, a low biological age um you might need to intubate if there's hypothermia um, and you want to um, uh, there, there's a lot of scenario where scenarios where you where the intubation can have a, a higher or moderate a priority the thing is it does not it, it's never something that takes over the priority of your compressions which is the highest priority this despite looking for reversible, reversible, reversible causes so only to the extent that the airway management putting the tube in will actually be the solution to reverse causes then it becomes a high priority otherwise it's a priority but not the highest priority and therefore you you can instruct the anesthesiologist to look during cpr and then use the five maximally 10 seconds when there's a, a break, a, a pulse uh, or, or a rhythm check, to put the tube in. Okay. So that's the that's the um, that's the uh, and, and and then you can when the, once the tube is in, then you can do uh, continuously a ventilation. Um, it's important to emphasize that it's only ten seconds, right? Uh, that you that they have and you often have to emphasize that because when when you're in the stress cone as an airway manager or you uh, or manager of the airway then it's really um you need someone to tell you now your time is up just as you need someone to tell you from the team in the vortex model that oh the de there's a desaturation um we need everyone's eyes and ears so you're not rude when you're saying to your airway management team that now now the time is up we have to continue with compressions okay um okay i so let's say that um the pa you, you have intubated the patients you you haven't really f uh, you might have found a few reversible causes that you're treating and then the patient uh has a increase in entitled co2 okay well 
that is a good sign it's not rusk but at neck uh, and should you stop for a rhythm check now i would suggest no you continue your compressions and then then there's this thing about if you have a um, if you have a non shockable rhythm you might ha you might um, uh, you, you, you will have either a, a systole or a PA, PEA and in the recent literature you have what you call pseudo PEA where you have a heart that is beating on a pocus so you, on your first rhythm check you will check your, the, your subcostal view and see if there's tamponade and you'll see if there's right chamber um, um, pressure um, and make sure that <laughs> you don't wait uh, you don't use too much weight on that data point because if the patient isn't arresting right in front of you then you can't use that data point for much because it, the heart will tampon out sorry it will balloon up and look like there's a uh, there's, there's look like there, there's a d sign even though there isn't but you will um you will use the the, the, the subcostal view to see if there's any heart movement and then there's also a discussion of how much heart movement is heart movement but if you have a PEA where the heart isn't moving then then at all then then it's really bad prognosis and then it's a true PEA if there if it's is moving though um I'm sorry if it's not moving then then, you, then it's only re the reversible causes that can really get that patient back probably um but if it's a true uh, if, 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 if it's what you would call a pseudo PEA, the heart is moving, um, then in the next rhythm analysis, you'll check for pocus pulse. Um, so maybe 10 or 15 seconds before the rhythm analysis, you will check for pulse. Uh, you'll put the pocus uh, uh, transducer on either the neck, uh, especially usually the neck, but you might, if, if there's a lot of stuff going on on the neck, you can try to use the, uh, the, the thigh and the femoral artery. And then you'll, once, uh, you should be able to see pulsation during CPR, but once it stops, you should, uh, if there is a rusk, uh, then you would be able to see what you call a pocus pulse. You'll see the pulse. And this is a really, really thin and thready pulse usually. You won't be able to feel it with a finger. And this is where it becomes a bit controversial. So is this rusk or not? There might be entitled CO2, and there might be a, um, a bit of a, a signs of life. The patient may open their eyes or something like that, but, uh, but, not, but only during compressions. And you need to continue even with the pocus pulse rising right, right now. Um, until there is a true pulse so you 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 even though there's a pocus pulse you'll probably go on uh, with your cpr um certain certain literature would suggest that you shouldn't just as long as it doesn't take on over priorities for um, um what you what you're going to treat for the reversible courses then i guess there's no harm in doing the compressions um but just, just to say that there's a there, there's emerging literature that tells you tells us that if you have a pocus pulse, then probably you should treat it as a severe shock, uh, or uh, and not like a cardiac arrest. But we're not, it's not mainstream yet. But you, you can use it at the S data point for uh, to suggest that you're going in the right direction, right? Okay, so. Um, so you have the uh, a, an increase in the entitled CO2. You might have uh, a heart that is beating, and, and uh, even though there's PEA, you may, might might see a pocus pulse. And now you're just waiting for the pulse actually to come back. Um, these are some of the like airway management and some of the newer things in 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 the uh, in, in the um, uh, handling of cardiac arrests. I think that's all I want to say right now about this topic. Uh, as I said, I might do a video uh, on this uh, in a, a later point. We already talked about the ABCs of the intubated patient. Always assess the um, or the intubation. Uh, the intubation is is patent and use the dose mnemonic to check if there's any kinks, any other. Uh, obstruction uh, and and pneumothorax and so on um, to, uh, when when the patient is coming in tubed and use the entitled CO2 for assessment. Okay, um, trick emergencies. 
Um, this is the topic I wanted to delve into a bit because um, sometimes when you have these patients, you don't have an ENT doctor or any specialist uh, with experience in these um, this patient group um, close by. So you need to handle it yourself. And that's why I just wanted to go through this a bit. So just quickly, uh, an anatomy update here. Um, this is the normal um, neck and uh, and uh, and the airway um, uh, where you have your your um, your mouth and your oropharynx going down to the um, laryngopharynx and into the larynx trachea and then down to the lungs. You have your esophagus down here. Um, in a tracheostomated patient, there's just a hole in and there's a hole called the stoma. Uh, in the neck. It's usually made around C2, C3, 4, um, I think. It's around there. I, I have it on another slide, but some, somewhere around there. I've never put in one, any of these and don't hope to do so, but it's, it's around there. Um, so it's below the cracothyroid membrane. And um, they have a, they still have their own area up here. Um, bear in mind that even though they might have their own area up here still, it might not be totally normal, uh, depending on the indication for why they had the trach. So even though you, as we will talk about, can use the uh, the upper airway, you shouldn't all, you should probably not always rely on it. Um, then you have the other um, patients with a hole in the neck, which is the laryngectomy. And this is where you actually remove the entire uh, vocal uh, cord area here. And you actually, the, the, the proximal part of the trachea and the vocal cords and the cracothyroid crack membrane and so on, you, you remove those and then you just have a hole in, uh, out into the, um, out into the um, open. And uh, you um, sew this part up and then you, uh, the, the mouth is only for uh, eating, not for breathing. Um, these are usually cancer patients. Um, uh, and when you when the patient comes in, you won't know which of the holes it is. Um, the potential good thing about this uh, situation, the tracheostomy, is that they have a, potentially have an upper airway that you can use if there have if there's a problem here, but these don't. Um, here. That's the side between the second and third, yeah, uh, tracheal ring is where you will put your tracheostomy. Okay. Yeah. So these both have the upper and lower airway. These don't, and you can you never know which one is which when, when they come in, unless they say so in the in their charts. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail before going into the emergency uh, cases for trach patients and laryngoscopy, laryngectomy patients. Um, so this is the tracheostomy patient with a um, tracheostomy kit in their, their um, airway. Um, this is a cuff. Um, this is what you call the outer cannula. And inside there is an inner cannula, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. And, and that will usually help with mucus. Um, then, there's, um, there's a, then there's a cuff. They don't always have a cuff. Um, and we'll get back to why in a little while. And um, notice that when the cuff is on, it is pressuring on the surrounding tissues, which it's good if the surrounding tissues are bleeding. When the cuff is on, then they don't, um, you cannot <laughs> use the upper airway. You will just blow uh, air into the esophagus. And when the cuff is on, um, you, you can use the lower airway. When, the, when they're decuffed, then you cannot, um, then, then, then the air you push in here, will probably go down here, but it also will go up here and out. So, um, and so, so, so it's not a complete, uh, if you want to ventilate the patient uh, in, a, in a more efficient way, you need to cuff the patient here. Um, the indications for um, doing a trick 
in the like emergency emergency situation sometimes ENT doctors are skilled at this enough to just do that instead of doing a cricothyroidectomy but outside of that um the, it's usually a non-emergency procedure where you probably often most often want to secure and maintain the airway um, um, this is usually if the patient has a neurological disease that is hindering this or if they have a high risk of aspiration um, if they are injured to the face and so on and so forth there's like a lot of um, reasons why you want to um, do this and one of the mean if, if one of the more common reasons is also if they have a heart to intubate upper airway then you can put in these uh, in advance of a procedure it's also if you have someone who are in the icu for a longer time then you, then it's a better solution than the uh than the tube um especially if it's decuffed because when it's decuffed then it's not pressuring on the on the uh, tissues um, and so in general it, it should be decuffed uh, for most patients um, in the longer term because uh, there's more benefit for uh, for the patient if it's decuffed in general it's only usually in the emergency in the emergencies uh, uh, that we uh, would like to um, cough in some some situations and it's also used for weaning when you want to get patients off the ventilator then this can be used as well um, it's important to know that one, once the patient comes in, you can actually connect this. If it's uh, again, if it's cuffed, then you can connect this directly to inhalations for asthma medication, for uh, BiPAP or NIV, for high flow oxygen, for uh, yeah, for all the devices that you use up here. You can use here directly on. There are some issues with this. Um, bypassing of the nose and, uh, and and the issues that these patients have and some of them I, again i'm no expert at this ask your ENT doctors for a deeper dive into this but just for emergency medicine purposes it's important to know that the nose is bypassed so they're not humidifying any air this means that they have a, a very dry uh, they have a dry nose and they have a really thick mucus um, because it's not being uh, humidified they can they can use a humidifier called in Swedish a NASA a nose uh, which is like a usually some kind of device that's put it directly on here um, and um, um, so to compensate for the for that um, and then they they have no smell as a result of their uh, dried up nose so they have low appetite for that reason for uh, also for that reason and it's important to know that the vocal cords are bypassed. The vocal cords are up here, but if no air passes there, then they cannot speak. There are ways around this. There are, are, there are like speak cannulas uh, that can be put in. There are uh, a lot of other ways. So they, they can um, speak, but not when they're tracheostomized and, and they, they're coughed. Um, they also have, when they don't have like this part of the upper airway, they have a less effective cough as well. So they have thicker mucus and less effective cough. So they're already they're like you can hear that mucus and obstruction is is a big problem here. Um, but also they have a reduced swallowing um, because of this device being here, um, especially during sometimes like to reduce aspiration risk. Um, they sometimes like it, it's sometimes done that they, they they cough up the patient so that they when they eat they reduce the reduce potentially reduce the aspiration risk but by doing so you also pressure on the airway uh, oh, sorry pressure on the esophagus uh, which would um, paradoxically make the patient have less appetite and may may uh, have a detrimental effect on their um, on on their uh, quality of life. So there's a risk assessment of whether you should cough or not when you're eating, and and that has to be taken into account. So all of these problems mm, results in that the patient has to take good care of their device. And the thing is, with uh, in general, this population who do achieve or do get either laryng laryngectomies or uh, tracheostomies, 
are compared to the general population a bit less um, caretaking uh, of themselves. Um, it, um, it comes from what kind of cancers they usually will have uh, and the reason why they have these um, usually are a population that might not take too good care of themselves before they got their trach and if they don't do that well then probably they won't continue um, taking good care of themselves even with a more complex problem now so it's not uncommon for them not to be able to care for, uh, for all of these this is not a general rule it's just a observation uh, from me and and uh, the colleagues i, I know uh, dealing with these problems but it's not evidence-based maybe i'm just biased and wrong but um the thing is there the, the, my point is you need to you need to do uh, do some care um for you to not to obstruct um with mucus and one of the things is that you need to suck daily you suck through this this um, um you, re you remove the inner cannula and then you um, suck in this uh, uh, channel, uh, the outer cannula. Um, you use your humidifier when you can, um, and you have this uh, inner cannula in. You can use it without the inner cannula as well, um, there, um, but uh, the inner cannula will help somewhat with the mucus. Um, then there's the don't cough while eating. Um, I just explained um, and then you have to take care of the like you, you have to get some kind of voice alternative so that the patient can speak um, there's a thing when the patient comes in also when you like the daily care on the department that is if you uh, get them to inhale um, um, sodium bicarbonate to try to like um, release some of the mucus so that they can cough it up. Sometimes they will feel that uh, it, there's much more mucus now that they have been moisturized, and it, it's, it's more hor it's hor more horrible for the patient th than before. But they have to cough it up. Uh, it's, it's it's the way to actually get rid of it. So they they just have more. It's more mobilized, and that's why it feels like they have to cough all the time. Uh, as um, as opposed to when it's really hard and thick and it's m not mobilized, um, it might just sit where the where it is and it doesn't really go into the airway in the same in the same way. Like it's not runny, but it's still a problem. So they have to get this inhalate, inhalated um, sodium bicarbonate, even though they don't feel like uh, getting it. Um, one of the uh, ENT nurses uh, gave us a rule of thumb for what patients have to do before they can actually go home. And if they don't live up to any of these, if they don't have uh, any suction devices, uh, th then it's like an admission, uh, reason for admission for the patients. So they need to be able to take out their inner calendar, need to be able to cough and pay into paper, need to be able to moisturize their upper airway and nose, need to be able to clean their tracheostomy. Um, and need to be able to use suction. Um, the cleaning of the uh, trigeostomy and the, like the outer cannula is also with um, suction and there are other me measures as well. Okay, let's just quickly review how the, um, the trigeostomy kit actually looks. You have your, what you call your outer cannula here. And in this, into this, you will put your uh, inner cannula, this device. Then you have an obturator here, which is a device that you use at like, kind of like a guide wire when you put in the uh, outer cannula. Um, it goes into the inner cannula, and it has to be removed when the patient breathes. Um, I took with this picture uh, just to show you that here's the, um, the where you will use as a, when you cough uh, the uh, the device here. And you, this goes to here, but in some devices, there's also another um, there's not another thing here sticking out that is also blue and looks like uh, a cuff almost for the untrained eye. So just to make sure that you don't use that as your cuff device, then um, um, I'll just want to show you this device. This device is actually a suction device that goes out here, and it will be so that you'll be able to suck. 
up whatever lands upon uh, uh, upon this trigosomy here, um, in theory at least. Okay, then all all of these also has you have to come with a neck band. If you're not having your neck band on right now, then you have to hold the tracheostomy in place with your hands. Okay, so this question to cough or not to cough. Uh, well, we quickly uh, one of the one of the nurses that educated us on this um, on Kaldinska, who were really experienced in this, uh, gave us a good advice that well, coughing, whether or not you should cough. Um, is a question of um, priorities but um, you should always as a care provider ask why is the patient coughed because the default should be not to cough the patient because they're like the mechanical strain on the area and uh, uh, is, is the reason why you shouldn't cough there are other reasons uh, as well but that's one of the main ones um, so the reason why you would, 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 would cough the patient is if there is a high aspiration risk. All well, that might make sense to, that you you want to uh, temporarily or permanently um, permanently to cough the patient, uh, taking into account their uh, their appetite <laughs> uh, when they're eating. Um, it might be because you want to positive uh, give them oxygen uh, through here, and you don't want the air to go up here. It might might be because you want to control local bleeding coming from um, uh, sometimes you can if if you have a cough uh, there might there might uh, or the the um, trick is at a kinked ankle it might annoy the tissue and you might have a fistula then it's uh, into an arterial uh, artery and you can sometimes by um, um, by blowing out the cough you can get a tampon out um, but we'll get into that in a little while. Here's just a picture uh, showing that, well, when you when it's cuffed, then the airway can. There is only one airway. When it's not cuffed, then you can. There is some amount of air going up here, and if it, especially if it's a fenestrated uh, kind of uh, outer cannula, then there's maybe um, a bit more than just a little air going up here, and. You need to cough it for you to be able to have a good airway. The fenestration, I think, is something um, I can't remember the, the cause of the fenestration right now, but uh, just know that there are some of these that are fenestrated and you need to um, cough it if you want to oxygenate the patient. The reason why we don't cough as a default are stated here. Um, there are others as well, but these are the main ones. And then if you want to cough, well, then you should cough with 20 to 30 uh, kilopascals. You might need a manometer for this to be exact. And if you don't have a manometer, you'll try to uh, use this, um, uh, just uh, feel this uh, device here this is, uh, to, to, to assess whether it's coughed enough. Uh, you'll usually, you, you will cough with air uh, as with a normal um, intubation tube. Some of the take-home points for these emergencies that the, the emergency trick situations that we will now get into are that, well, you can often uh, ventilate a tracheostomated patient from above, but you, when you see a patient with a hole in their neck, you don't, never know whether it's a tracheostomy, whether you actually have an upper airway that is patent, or whether it's a, it might be a laryngoscopy, where we, uh, sorry, laryngectomy, where they don't even have a upper airway. So. Um, you can use it, but don't. Uh, and, and if you need to use it, then you have to um, decuff the patient. But don't rely on it. Um, then there's the main reasons why they, they these patients come to us is, uh, at the emergency department is because of bleeding or obstruction, and also sometimes decanalization that they, they 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 can't get it in because the stoma is is, uh, is done. And the thing is that the stoma, if it's new. And then it will um, just once you you take out the tracheostomy, then it will then it will uh, disappear or, or very quickly anyway. It will um, um, so so you always for a new stoma, you always have to put something in the hole if the tracheostomy is not there, if the um, if the uh, outer cannula is not there, and um, a new one is usually seven to fourteen days. Older is older than that, but. The older it is, the more secure it is. So I wouldn't necessarily rely on just because it's 15 days or 21 days. I, I'll 
from what I gather, I probably still put something into the airway uh, until I can get something uh, or something into the stoma until I can get a secure airway with a new trach. And what you, the thing that you put into the airway, it can be a long nasal speculum. It can be some um, retractors. Um, it, it can, but you need to make do with what you, with what you have. EM cases did a good quick hits uh, 34 here on where, where they showed this and where they went through tracheostomy emergencies, and you can go check that out as well. There are some discrepancies bef be between what we were taught uh, in in our courses and what they suggest here that we do. Um, the main one is that um, they think that they, they emphasize that we should use the upper airway to ventilate if there's problems down here. But in general, uh, as we talked about, you, you can never be too sure whether this actually is a good uh, alternative and rather um, our, uh, the guidelines I will go through rather focuses on you um, managing this uh, problem. Okay, so trig emergencies. Um, these two pages are really good. This is called tracheostomy.se um, or lof.se, and this is in this. This other one is a scan, is a sorry a, a, um, ENT homepage in, uh, from from Swansea, where I've gathered some of the pictures from. Um, these are both really great, um, and this is great for algorithms this is more good for um, physiology and like anatomy and such all right so the first emergency the obstruction the obstruction patients so let's say you have a patient coming in with a tracheostomy or a hole in the neck you don't know whether it's a laryngectomy or a, a tracheostomy and and they're desetting and they're they sound like they're like coughing and obstructed and there's no blood Okay. Um, then you have, um, it, and it might, this might be because of pneumonia. It might be because of, so that they have an increased production of mucus, but it might be also maybe just as common um, non-compliance or lower compliance with these care, um, with the care of the tracheostomy that you need because of the um, the disadvantages um, that we just went through with the tracheostomy. So you'll get thick mucus if you don't humidify and don't suck the airway regularly. Um, so what do you do with this patient? Well, you step one is to remove the inner cannula. Um, apparently this will um, this will solve the situation in a lot of, I, I write 95% I write of the cases, maybe not that much, but a lot of the cases will be resolved by just removing the intercalinia and applying oxygen to the trach. Um, then you have a step two, which is uh, just basic suction as opposed to advanced suction. Um, basic suction is just su suction of the outer cannula. Um, you will um, use your um, soft suction device um, on 25 kilopascal and then you'll um, measure with the inner cannula, inner cannula that you just removed you will um, measure the length of the inner cannula which is also the length of the outer cannula um, and that's how you make sure that you're only sucking uh, to the uh, like the edge of the outer cannula um, and um, you'll you'll have a black marker on the, where you will mark this line on the on your suction device, so that you know also for next time where you're going to suck maximally. Um, then you go into the device. Uh, you're going to with your suction device into the uh, outer cannula, and you will um, not suck on your way in, but you will uh, suck on your way out. And you will suck uh, once you're all the way in. You will suck in the 360 degrees um, way so that you get all of the surrounding areas. Um, then you can also consider at this point inhaling the patient with sodium chloride. And as I mentioned before, they will usually think that your mucus is becoming worse. It's just because they are now mobilizing their mucus and they need to cough it up. 
um, you can also just instead of inhalation you can drip with a few droplets of sodium chloride and just make sure to stand back because now you're pouring in liquid into the airway so they will cough and uh, this will be all over the place okay step three is that you do what you call advanced suction uh, advanced suction would be um, beyond the outer cannula and there's a risk of bleeding that's why you don't do it as a first step but um, depending on the situation you might do these two steps at once um, what you want to do here when you advance your suction device beyond the outer cannula um, then you you want to uh, assess whether there's a mechanical stop that it stops earlier than you uh, would expect sometimes that can be because that there either there's a hard obstruction uh, like a hard mucus block or it might be that you uh, that the device is kinked so that it's not going straight into the airway but it's like going into the wall between the esophagus and the um, trachea um, and you might want if there's time you might want to use fiber optics um, to to assess what is in there Uh, if there's no stop, then you'll just do suction of the deeper airway. Step four is actually to remove uh, the outer cannula. And remember now that if it's a really new um, stoma, then you have to put in something else into the device. Uh, sorry, into the stoma. And that, that might be a long nasal speculum. So you will, have to, for removal, you'll uh, decuff um, the patient and then you'll just. Um, remove the trach uh, and continue to have um, O2 like oxygenation of the stoma um, while you have something in it um, for holding it open and then um, you will um, you will pull in a smaller trach uh, tracheostomy uh, after that or you will intubate with a, a tube through the stoma Sometimes, if that's not an opportunity, you have you might try to do it from above. It depends on the anatomical situation. Here is the here is the um, the actual uh, algorithm here from the Swedish uh, Löf homepage, and there's also a video that goes along with it that you can check out. Yeah, here's the video. All right, so. If your patient for the pneumonia part of it beyond like antibiotics and so on the increase in mucus production and what you do you do for that well you you maintain good hygiene suction and the in the, in the cannula in place and so on um, you will have to um, use inhaled, inhaled uh, sodium um, sodium uh, chloride for uh, every three, 30 minutes uh, and then cough fissure th therapy and then you have to use inhaled moisturized air um you can the nurses that we talked to suggested that you could use high flow you don't need to necessarily need the high flow but you need some moisturizing of of the air and that's why the device the optoflow device could be good for this this is not anything I've, i have from base from, from guidelines i should say this is from uh advice from from nurses okay uh, just for your own uh um Curiosity, I've, I've also um, taken in this. Um, if we decannulate on the on the department, what what, what how how how's the algorithm look there? And you can check this out by yourself. Um, then you have bleeding. If it's bleeding from either the uh, the stoma or from the uh, tracheostomy outer cannula itself, and there's is is important distinguishing uh, distinct distinction. So bleeding can either come from the from the stoma, which is a bit less dangerous because it's not something that necessarily has a direct contact to the airways, especially if it's cuffed the the, the other cannula. Then then it can the bleeding can only go up. It can still bleed a lot, but um, it's not as dangerous because it can go in can go into the airways. But then it can bleed from the um, tracheostomy uh, itself, like the outer cannula, and that's more dangerous because that can go into the airways. Um, so what do you do from the stoma? Well, you cuff up so the blood doesn't go into the airways. Then you can numb the area with 
uh, gauze with adrenaline, uh, sorry, with cytokine, and also soaked with uh, CXA. You can also just, uh, you, you will usually also like with normal local anesthetics um, with needles and push some cytokine into the area. Um, rarely, the the doctors I told uh, I, I talked to um, think that they need to use uh, reversing agents with just a stomal bleed, uh, with the rare occasion that it, they're really really on a lot of anticoagulation, then it might bleed even though you're you're compressing the area and then you have to reverse. Um, if it's ble bleeding from the trach, then it's a bit more dangerous, and then you have to cough up again. If you don't have a patient with a cough. Or the cuff isn't working, then you have to remove the uh, the um, cannula and then put in a, a one with the cuff, because you want to potentially tamponade the potential fistula in there um, and then protect the airway for for, for the stoma uh, bleeding. Then you want participation in sitting position, and then you want to suck the um, the outer cannula and even uh, suck uh, deeper. Um, and then you probably will consider reversing. For details, check out first and EM and EM cases for this. There are these guidelines from the uh, Swansea, the UK um, homepage that I uh, that I showed you earlier. And that's it for tracheo tracheo um, uh, tracheostomy patients. Um, now we'll go into uh, risk patients for RSI.
All right, here in the end, I just want to go through a case with you and see um, how this might uh, unfold in a real case. So this is a um, um, patient around um, 65 years, years of age. Um, she comes in with um, three days of, three days of um, dyspnea, uh, which has been worsening the last uh, 24 hours, but the family hasn't reacted on it because she uh, lives um, alone. Um, in the background, she has PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, and she's just been um, on a high dose of prednisone for this uh, and are still on a quite high dose of prednisone. She has a BMI of over 65, uh, sorry, uh, 35, and she has a uh, newly developed uh, diabetes type 2 because of the prednisone treatment, and she's hypotensive, and she has been given the, the COVID vaccine times 4. On your assessment, um, there's no strider or hoarseness or trismus. She actually has a stable A. She has a un unstable B with a SAT of 92 on 15 liters. Uh, she has a uh, respiratory frequency of 40, and she is um, she's she's sitting um, um, and she can be she can be she can lie fly on her back, um, but but she, uh, she seems more comfortable when she is at least uh, has a, a um, elevated head. Um, her blood pressure is 90 over 50. Her pulse is 140. She's warm and she has a capillary refill time around 4 to 5. Her uh, GCS is 14. Uh, the GCS is really bad here because she's really uh, motor, motor, uh, motor, uh, motor wise agitated and doesn't really come through here in the GCS. But she's a bit confused and dazed. But otherwise, she's um, localizing as she has open eyes. Um, no focal motor deficits and she. Um, but she does like this, like uh, she's agitated, so she takes off her mask repeatedly, and um, she's quite strong, so it's quite hard to make her uh, keep it on. Um, she has 40 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, and she's no skin changes. Okay, so how would you, what kind of syndromes are you thinking about uh, here? Um, and how would you handle that initially? Well, there's a few things in this history that makes us uh, really scared um, that the patient despite 15 liters of non-rebreather non has only 92 percent and she's uh, has a high um, uh, respiratory frequency which is a, um, a really bad sign in especially the older population she was around 65 so this is bad she has a shock index that is high a pulse of 140 um, and a blood pressure of 90 over 50 and a CRT. So she's she's um, she's shocked. And also, this is a really um, uncomfortable sign as well. She This might be because of delirium, because of a potential infection or what, what, whatever thing is causing this. But this might, might also be because of a hypo perfusion. It might also become because of hypo, hypoxia. So, and, and it might be a combination of all of them. So this is a sick patient, and also the patient has PMR. She's uh, she's um, immunocompromised, and uh, she's um, not only immunocompromised. She's also um, potentially uh, in. Uh, she potentially have a secondary Addison's, uh, or at least you must consider this during this um, with this history and this blood pressure. Um, so, your initial uh, thoughts on this might, so far, just from this, be, well, sepsis in an immunocompromised patient, you might have secondary addisons, and she might be hypovolemic as well, um, dehydrated. So, your treatment here would probably be to get two in, uh, IVs in as fast as possible, give her some fluid. You might um, check her before giving her fluid. Check the, uh, check her heart and uh, like, is it hyperdynamic? How is her IVC? It might be a bit hard because of her 140 uh, in frequency, but um, you might 
it's a dynamic uh, examination, so you might be able to gauge whether it becomes better after the after the, uh, you give her fluids, and you will assess whether or not she's a responder of fluids or not. If she's not a responder of fluids, then you will quickly um, move to giving her um, vaso agents uh, via your uh, anesthesiology colleagues, or you will at least discuss this. You will probably straight away give her uh, a broad spectrum antibiotics you might i've, I've just written here pep, uh, pepresilin and tazobactam um, but you might give uh, even broader depending on how much you think the immune immunocompromisation might play in and where you think the focus is and whether she's been infected before and been been um having had, had cultures before with uh, strange bacteria. But right away, we, we usually just give this or uh, something similar. And then you, I'll probably in this case, give her solucotef because of her high high um, prednisone dose um, to um, just to cover the Addison, the potential Addison. So because we have so many different causes for the hypotensive um, um, problem. Um, we have something leading, to, leading like we have the um, hypovolemic part. Um, we don't have a cardiogenic risk. We don't have a arrhythmogenic risk uh, right now. She ha she does have 140, but that's from the history. It's very much and because it's not above 140, um, then it's very likely to be uh, secondary to dehydration and to se probably sepsis. And we also have potentially vaso vasodilation causes of her shark and uh, Addison. So there's multiple causes of her shark here. Um, so what you also want to do is like you want to call anesthesia. This patient potentially if she needs to be intubated, which is not unlikely, especially because she is motor uh, motor agitated. Um, so so you might <laughs> and she she's plugging off her mask. Uh, so you might need to do something, maybe a DSI sedation, maybe uh, something else. You also probably want to get her to, go, get, get her to CT scan to be able to actually assess whether there's anything going on in the lungs or the abdomen for focus, um, looking for focus um, uh, of, the, of the infection. And um, you might be able to do this with a focus in the situation. If you really don't want to do the CT scan, um, and you just want to go to in intensive care uh, to begin with, then you then you might consider doing a very thorough focus to see if you can find a, uh, for instance, a consolidation on a lung, or if you can find a, a gall, like a cholestitis, something like that. The abdomen is, by the way, non-tender and uh, not um, um, metaristic. You will also use a, use a, a, a arterial blood gas, probably because of her dyspnea. You might choose to do an ABG here instead of a VBG, but in general, VBGs are should be the main thing. We we don't we probably don't gather much information by using or getting an ABG here. Um, the reason why we might consider getting an ABG here is that she could be hard to um, get an IV on. And AVGs are easier to get then because if you have a pulse, then it's easier to get than often than a VBG. Um, you'll culture her, urine samples, blood cultures. Um, you'll do um, this is a culture. Uh, this is a social culture difference between Denmark and Sweden. Uh, whether the, like the extent of how you will do your um, nasopharyngeal um, cultures. Um, but some some matter of uh, nasopharyngeal cultures you will get because she has a B problem and a purple infection, so it's high priority to get something, especially COVID tests. You might get some urine samples as well for, for antigen of pneumococcus and Legionella, um, and then you'll get a like blood sample for sepsis, which might be liver liver um, tests, which might which might be. Uh, like hemoglobin, thrombocytes, uh, CRP, um, um, creatinine, and and uh, from uh, like and, and and so on, like um, uh, to assess the severity and uh, potential kidney failure and so on. So let's get a, few, a bit more data when we collected these. The prioritize what you will prioritize is like I would call anesthesia first of all, then I would. 
uh, make sure that we get the PVKs in parallel and get fluids on board and get these things on board. These other things here, the cultures are important, but she do the blood cultures first, and then the urine uh, can wait. Do, getting a catheter on her can wait um, a few minutes. Um, also, these blood samples can wait. Um, if they wait, then I'll probably, after I call uh, for anesthesia, I'll do the ABG myself. Uh, and then maybe move on to do the focus while my team is doing these things. Yeah, of course, sorry. Uh, COVID-19 COVID and uh, as a cause of the sepsis is, of course, always um, in these ages, um, in these times, a consideration. Okay, we move on. So when you do the focus, uh, you see that the, she has dry lungs. There's, there is a suggestion of a consolidation with focal beelines and shred sign on the right side, uh, basal uh, on the basal lung. You have a high, you, yes, you think you have a hyperdynamic heart. It's hard to assess when they're tachycardic, and you have an IVC below one centimeter. The patient is going in AFib, which is new, and all things considered, if it was a primary AFib, it would probably go around 160 and above. Um, rule of thumb is 220 minus their H as the max, um, but around in my experience, is like around 160, maybe 180, then the signal becomes pretty high for this to be a primary for um, atrial fibrillation. This is probably uh, this is like when it's around 120, 140, it's much more likely to be a secondary. Um, especially in the context of sepsis. So uh, I would primarily treat the online cause rather than treat uh, as a primary AFib. Um, the ABG has a PO2 of 8 on 15 liters of reservoir mask. That's bad. <laughs> um, she has a lactate of 8. She has a high adrenaline spike, so it's not necessarily this is a hypoxic thing, but it's a bad sign in, in a potential sepsis patient, of course. Um, she has, she's hyponatremic and she's hypokalemic and she has, but and she is, for all she's breathing, she's actually kind of reta retaining some of her PCO2. I would love to have for this to be lower, but it might suggest that she's obese. It might suggest that she's, she's tiring out. Um, but you need to follow this. This is just one data point. And this is, um, I'm not sure what to make of that she's not metabolic, uh, metabolically sour. Uh, I'm not sure why I didn't get the pH here. I think the pH was not necessarily that low. I think it was, was maybe 7.2, 7.3, but low nevertheless. Um, she, I didn't get the chloride here, but it's, she, she has a... Um, uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And in those cases, you can go with uh, mud piles or gold mark, or I usually go with cult, K U L T. Is there ketoacidosis here? No, probably not. Um, but it's easy to take a ketone quickly. Um, uremia, is there uremia? Yeah, there is uremia, very, very likely. So that's part of it. Lactate. Well, we know there's higher lactate, so that might be driving some of it. Um, and then tox is probably not the reason why. So uh, probably a mixture of uremia and uh, lactoacidosis, secondary to sepsis and hypo uh, perfusion of the of the tissues um, would be my guess here. Okay. Um, so we add hypokalemia and hyponatremia to our um, to our uh, differential here of syndromes, and uh, and you think that the focus is in the lungs um, because of the focal, the, the quite high um, significant sign on with the consolidation. But you um, you want to uh, be more if you want to be more sure, you need a CT scan here. Okay, so what now? What do we do? Do we go to CT? Do we wait a little bit? Or do we do intrigual intubation? Do we do NIV? 
to do DSI on this patient because she's so she's plucking off her mask all the time. This is an open question, and I think it's handled differently in different cultures, and you need to handle it with your anesthesiologist in the given situation. I think there's an argument to be made that CTs. And CT is not necessarily that important right now. We don't think that she has a brain bleed for this. We don't think that she has meningitis, um, even though um, that is always a, a potential opportunity here. Um, she has such a severe B problem that it's probably not that. Um, she would uh, probably have more of a CD problem than a BC problem with meningitis. So. Um, and, and so we don't need the, the CT before we do any kind of lumbar puncture if that's what we want. So the CT for diagnosis is mainly on the focus of the lungs. Maybe when there's such a patient, you will take the abdomen with in the assessment. Um, but it's not, um, this is not high priority, I think, in this case where we've actually found a consolidation and we're quite sure that this is the case. Um, and it wouldn't change management. That would be probably it, it could be quite um, problematic for this patient to lie flat there. And we need and so uh, if we need the, if we want to push for the CT, we really need to do an intubation here. Um, should we go with NIV uh, bypass? Well, she probably has pneumonia. Doesn't seem like she, she has primary hypoxic, but primary hypoxemia because of pneumonia. If it was COVID, then maybe, but in general, no, I don't think that NIV would be the, what she needs right now. It might be a temporary measure for a short while, but she's so aggravated, um, maybe mainly because of the hypoxemia, but probably because of other stuff as well. So um, probably what we need to do is not NIV. Um, we need to consider whether we should Wait or intubate or do a DSI. And the DSI argument would be if we think this is hypoxemia primarily and we need to pre oxygenate the patient before an endotracheal intubation. And well, that, that could be a good solution here. Uh, we could also wait, but the thing is, her problem is not reversible right away, probably. Um, and it will probably get worse before it gets better. So it might be better to to either have her on high monitoring on on on, uh, on uh, the intensive care, or to um, intubate her so that she uh, is not tying out more and crashing, <laughs> and so that you can have a bit more control with her um, um, oxygenation, and you potentially can go to CT after that. This is the kind of the weighing in here. So we have to use this now. It is kind of like predicted de clinical deterioration, but it's also to correct O2 and CO2 pro problems. And in case of she's tying out, it may maybe also because to maintain a patent airway. Um, we're not there yet, but it's main, mainly for a correction of O2 and also for another reason that it's not here, but because of uh, agitation, we need to consider sedation here. How likely is failure here? Well, um, if we <laughs> if we look at our um, triangle here, then anatomically, well, she's obese. She has a lot of, uh, we don't know the melon patty right now, but she can open her mouth. Um, she uh, has a very big neck. And um, she's, I mean, there, so there's definitely anatomical challenges here. Uh, physiologically, um, she has all of the hop killers. She has low pH, she has hypoxia, and she has hypotension. So this is a high, high risk patient. She's also at high risk of critical desaturation quickly because of her uh, size. Um, so there's a lot to think about here before she's a high risk, high risk patient. She's also not fa fasting potentially because she's an RSI and her, her condition. It, it's probably not a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, 
she didn't have any D sign on her um, on her pocus, and she should have had a D sign with such a severe B problem. Um, so it's, it's probably not that. Uh, usually with with blood clots, you would not get high high fever like 40 degrees. So but she, that doesn't mean that she do, doesn't have. She could have had a minor blood clot that might be part of this, but it's not. It's not that much of a problem to begin with. And and the main thing would be here uh, that this is a pneumonia. Um, so condition-wise, it's it's more about the hop killers. Yourself, well, you've just done done a I don't know seven eight hour lecture a series on on this topic, so that's all right. Um, um, you you could be team leader on this with the anesthesiology um, anesthesiologist beside you. Um, the team you you probably in this case want a very experienced team because this is a really hard case. Um, to intubate and the equipment and place for the intubation well you want to not be at the CC scan while doing this you want to be at as a, at a um, good like a, a well-equipped place and probably in you in the ICU um, if she's transportable which she might be um, But you can argue this in different ways, right? So you might consider this to be a, well, will you want to intubate because she might deteriorate because she has a dynamic airway and you, she might obstruct? Well, then and this, is, this is a, and there's a high likelihood of failure here. Then maybe you want to wait and give her some time and see if she stabilizes on some other measures. But you can also interpret this situation as more like, well, the risk there is some risk, but it's not that low risk. We have a good team, it's experienced, and we will resuscitate her before we do anything, so that we get the blood pressure up, so that we um, do a lot of th things to to make the situation better. Well, then it's not a, that a big deal. You could also argue that well, her O2 problem is the main problem, and that will will not will not get better. Well, and then even if failure is unlikely, um, then you should probably then you should go into intubation. Um, but if you think that the failure is really really likely, um, you don't have the expertise on your team right now, then you might argue that you give her some time. So just to, I just wanted to show you like this is not black and white. This is an, this is a assessment, and depending on what you find is the indication for intubation and depending on what you find is the risk and in the risk there's also how good your team is what competences are there and so on and then 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 you can <laughs> then you can decide different things in different situations but but with the same case okay So you do your planning, <clears throat> as we talked about, you say, well, <clears throat> we decide that we need to intubate her in the ICU. You plan A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, and C. You think that RSI is the best way to go here. Um, your plan A is to uh, intubate her um, probably with ketamine here. You might even do a, a, a DSI where you sedate her a little bit before. So that you can probably proper uh, pre-oxygenate her. Um, if she does lose her airway at any time, or go into C go, go into heart uh, cardiac arrest, then you will um, do uh, CPR and prioritize intubation because of hypoxemia. You want to resuscitate her as much as possible before, so you will want to have two IV accesses at least, and you want to give her fluids. You want to um, try to do all these things if possible, if she, if if it allows, if, if the situation allows it, uh, her her condition, but also her uh, agitation allows it. If not, then you maybe have to do a DSI to resuscitate her. Okay. Um, so what you're saying here is that, well, she's a high-risk patient. She will resuscitate her and see if she responds. But if she doesn't respond to any of that, then you will go and see 
intrathecal intubation, you will use a value laryngoscope, a bushy, and a tube size 7. You might do a DSI in between here. If that doesn't work, um, then you'll do an LMA with an IGL size 5. And if that doesn't work, you'll, then you'll do back valve, back valve masking and then um, move to phone if then none of these works. You will call your expert um, and you won't do this in, the, in a stable environment like an um, intensive care unit. And this is what you brief your team with. You position the patient and you do the, and in this case, you had to sedate her a little bit um, um, for her um, DSI to work, uh, for, for her um, resuscitation and uh, preoxygenation to work optimally. You position, you position her in the ramped um, position with your uh, ear external notch um, and your 30 degrees here and your um, sniffing position. So, you, because you're in the ICU, you do a thrive. You you um, give her um, um, alongside with um, oxygenation with a NIV mask. Um, you you um, you you give her a thrive as well uh, through the, uh, through the nose. If not, then you just nasal cannula. Um, you you will use CPAP because she's a big um, she's a, um, she has a high BMI and you prepare all the stuff with your dump kit and you medicate the medication you wanted to use because of hypotension she turned out not to be a responder sadly so because of hypotension you will use ketamine um, in a low dose you will use rocuronium. Um, and you will not use painkillers. You will try to use uh, noradrenaline as a rescue drug, but already before you will try to um, not just have it ready, but actually have it going um, because of her hypotension. Um, now it's time to do the procedure. You explain, just recap the plan ABC uh, for your team. You give the drugs, and then you um, uh, you assess the airway by uh, sorry, not assess the airway, but you um, do your intubation with EVA LI technique. You go, you, you get into the airway, and you place the tube, and you see that there is uh, entitled CO2, and everyone is happy. You do your post intubation measurements, and um, everyone is is happy, and. Um, you remember that you cannot let go of the uh, stress on the team um, um, right now. You need to make sure that the patient is being monitored properly and then treated. This is how the case could have gone. In this case, and I'm not blaming anyone uh, for this, this is really... Um, Difficult. Um, this is how I went through the case um, up until the moment where we had to choose medication. Um, the medication chosen for this and the way it was given um, was not uh, with um, from, uh, was not with ketamine uh, and it was propofol. And I'm sure even if even if we had used ketamine, it probably would have gone a bit south because she was so hypertensive. But here, um, the propofol was used, um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if it was incremental doses or if it was a full dose it was given at the time. But um, in this in this case, uh, propofol was chosen. She went into cardiac arrest. Not necessarily. Again, I'm not blaming anyone for this. It, it, this might have been. And this might have happened also with ketamine. Um, she was given phenylephrine afterwards and and uh, noradrenaline. Um, I did the um, focus part on this, and uh, she had a um, focus pulse uh, and a beating heart, but she had no um, ROSC, um, and her entire zero two was low. Even, um, and we did after um, giving all of this treatment um, see after a while that she came back, and. Um, um, breathe um, 
uh, sorry, uh, we saw a spike up in and silent CO2. We could, we, we could, um, we could, beside the pocus pulse, also uh, feel her pulse, and she attained rask and had a good neurological, uh, uh, good neurological outcome. Okay.